Okay, then welcome to my afternoon session, Domain Storytelling. Uh, good afternoon. I know it's after lunch. And the first question I have is, um, does anybody understand German here? Ah, few people. Okay, I want to make some cheap uh, jokes in German, so... Uh, well... <laughs> Sorry? Okay, then, then I'm going to try to speak slowly with the, with the jokes. Okay, <clears throat> I hope you had a great conference so far, and to be honest, you're the best auditorium I have today. So. <laughs> okay, and as the session is called Domain Storytelling, I like to start with a little story. So, let's imagine a group of cavemen sitting around their campfire in the middle of the winter. And, of course, it's, it's comfy, but it's boring. So, one of them tells a story and tells how he hunted the mighty bison of the steppe so that they now can nourish from it in the, in the cold winter. And not only the, the storytelling is part of this, but also the art, um, while the warrior is telling his story, another of the cavemen is painting this picture on the wall. So, and now, 16,000 years later, we still can see this picture, um, this one of the earliest pieces of human art, and we still want to do the same things. We want to spark a campfire, tell a story, and paint a picture. And legacy systems, of course, yeah, that's right. I haven't thought about that. <clears throat> okay, of course, today it's a bit different. Our campfire is typically a whiteboard, and <clears throat> the story is told to us by our domain experts or by our users. And also the picture is drawn onto the whiteboard, like my colleague, Stefan is doing here. Usually I give this talk together with him, but today he couldn't make it, so it's only me. And <clears throat> talking about me, I'll give a short introduction of myself so you know who's talking to you. My name is Henning Schwentner. Um, that's Schwentner, or for the non-German native speaker, it's pronounced like this, Schwentner. And of course, you can find me all over the internet at, at S, sorry, as at H Schwentner. Oh my God. <clears throat> What's my background? I have studied computer science at the University of Hamburg. I'm 39 years old. I like good food, good yoga, good football. That's not so easy when you live in Hamburg. And I'm a proud dad. But of course, I'm not here to talk about my private life. I'm here to talk about work. And at work, I'm a coder, coach, and consultant. So, coder, coach, consultant. I prefer the coding part, but you know the consultant part. You make more money. Okay, first of the cheap German jokes for the uh, younger people in the auditorium. Hallo, Ibims, eins Ehrenmann. Okay, it's, it's not working. <laughs> <clears throat> this is the language of the German youth. At least that's what the internet says about it. Okay, I work... <laughs> okay, I'm working for a company in Hamburg. It's called WPS, or Workplace Solution. That's Whiskey Papa Sierra. Whiskey Papa Sierra. And we're a company of about 100 people doing um, software development and consulting. Maybe you have heard about us as the people with a touch table. And... Uh, Important fact, we're opening a new office in Berlin this year, so if you're looking for a new job, <laughs> um, speak to me afterwards. Okay, but back to the stories. I want to give you another story, a story from a domain, so we can see how it works um, with real stories uh, and real domains. And the story goes like this. We have Bob, and Bob wants to reduce his carbon footprints and wants to buy a new electrical car. But he has one problem, he has no money. Okay, can he get a car for this anyway? First answer, no, of 
course not. You should laugh here. So that was the idea. Okay, but <clears throat> second answer, he goes to his car seller and the car seller tells him, no problem, you don't have money, but we have money and what we do is we will buy the car for you and then rent it to you for a monthly installment, for a monthly payment. That is called leasing. Okay. That's our domain, but how do we design a program for that? Yeah, to design a program for that, we have to look into the process more deeply. So we have Bob, our customer, and he tells his wish for a car to our salesperson. And the salesperson then calculates the installment for the contract, so the monthly payment the customer would have to pay for the car. Gesundheit. And then the customer signs the contract, if he's okay with the contract and the installment. And now, we're not done yet, um, as you would think naively, <clears throat> because the salesperson has to pass on the contract to a so-called risk manager, because the risk manager has to check the risk. And the risk manager checks the credit rating for that. So if the credit rating is good, then the risk is low, and then we can make the contract. And he calculates the resale value for the car. So that means if the customer cannot pay his or her um, installments, then we can always resell the car for this resale value. OK. And let's assume the credit rating is good, and the resale value is good, and we want to make the, the contract, then the risk manager votes the contract. So he says, yes, we want, want to do this business. And after that, the salesperson can then give the car to the customer. Of course, in real life, there are other things happening, but they didn't fit onto the slide, and I think that's enough for what I want to tell you here. So what we can see here is a domain story. So... What's a domain story? A domain story is a, a picture of what we are told by our domain experts. That's why we call it a domain story, because we let our domain experts tell us their story and then we record it in this graphical notation. Let's look more deeply into this. How is domain storytelling working? So the first and important thing is that we have the right people in the room. So we want to talk to the right people. We want to talk to our domain experts. So it's always good if we can get Chuck Norris. But if we can't get Chuck, then we need people that are really doing the work, that really understand what's happening. And we let them tell us their story. So best, of course, if it's not a fairy tale. So we want to know what's really happening in the domain. Only if we know what's really happening, we can help them with our software. So a domain we don't understand, we cannot support with software. So that means we as technical people have to understand our domain. Sad truth, but it doesn't help. So <clears throat> as we all know, it's very easy to misunderstand when we hear a story. So the expectations can differ. And we don't want to have that when we build software. I know a couple of projects that are exactly like this. <laughs> and I think most of you do too. So we want to bring the knowledge together. We want to have the same knowledge. So what we do is we let the domain experts tell their story, like the salesperson passes on the contract to the risk manager, and then we repeat what we understand in this graphical notation. So the salesperson hands over the contract to the risk manager. Okay, there we already can see a difference. Hand over passes. Is that right? Well, we don't know because we don't have the domain experts here. But that's what we want to show our domain experts. We want to show them, this is what I understood of what you told me. Did I understand it right? Or did I understand it wrong? That's the question we want to answer. So, in other words, it's a form of active listening. Active listening is not only listening, but also repeating what I understood. 
Okay, that's what we want to do. We want to listen to the story, repeat it, so we can see we understand it in the correct way. And we do this with concrete stories. We want to hear the concrete stories from our experts and not abstract processes. Because normal people, non-technical people, people from the domain, are used to stories, but are not used to formal notations, to, abstract, to abstraction at all. So we want to be as concrete as it's right for our users, for our domain experts. And that's why this domain storytelling thing has a very simple notation. So you don't have to explain it a lot. It's just basically two icons and one arrow. That's it. We have these actors that are the people that are doing things. We have the work objects, the things they are working with. And then we have one kind of arrow, that's the activity. What the actor is doing with the work object. So example like we have seen in the story before, we have an actor, the risk manager, we have a work item, the contract, and we have an activity, votes. So what we can do now is that we use different icons for the actors and the work objects. For example, we can use for the actors a person or a group of persons or an IT system or whatever we want to do with them. We can put in a head on their head or a tie around the neck, so we can show that's a boss or something like that. I use different colors. So we, it's easy when we look at the, the, at the picture that we can understand what's meant there. And the same is true for the work objects. Now also we can use different icons, like a dollar sign here for the installment or a car sign for the car, of course. Since very often our work objects are documents, like down here, we sometimes don't use document, 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 but other things like the medium this is transported on. Like here it's um, passed on the phone or something like that. Okay, so a very basic, very simple pictographic language. Actors, work objects, activities, and sequence numbers, so we have the time in our pictures. And there's no, as you might have noticed, no if, no switch, no or, things like that. Because that's how we think, programmers think, but that's not like normal people think. When you look at the fairy tale, it's not like Hansel and Gretel go into the, into the woods um, if the weather is nice, and if the weather is not nice, then they stay at home. So that's not how stories are told. And that's not what we want to hear. We want to hear real stories and so we paint one case, we start typically with the 80% case, and maybe we hear another story for a, for a different case. But we don't want to have the, the cases here in our story, because the story has to be easily understood by our domain experts. So then it's typical that we have the actors once and the work objects several times. So the stories fold around the actors. It's in a human-centric way, because we put the actors in the middle. So like here, we have the customer one time, and he fills out the contract, and then he signs the contract, and we see the same contract again. And we can see later that it's a good idea to have the contract again and again. <clears throat> and to record a story, we put sentence for sentence into the picture. So we start with the first step, the customer tells his wish for a car to the salesperson, and the second step, the salesperson calculates the installment for the contract. With these sequence numbers, we get the, the time dimension into the picture. And a typical setup to start is something like this. So we have a lot of empty space here where we can draw, and then we have a little space to write down things we want to um, we don't want to forget when we paint the picture. Things like preconditions or assumptions or annotations and variations of this story. Okay. One of the basic ideas below that is that we want to, that, that three good examples are better than one bad abstraction. 
especially when we're communicating with domain experts. So it's better to tell the same story in three different variations and paint three pictures instead of making one abstraction which a domain expert, a domain person cannot understand. So, back to our domain story from the leasing example. And again, how do we design a program for that? And talking about design and domain, well, domain-driven design is not so far away. And, or as we say it in the internet, hashtag DD design, or again, cheap jokes. I know nobody will laugh, but was ist das für eins Design von Domain her? Okay, no, no young people here, that's the problem. Okay, but for the older people, um, the typical typo uh, in German, Domian-driven design. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. No, no, no more jokes. Okay, the basic idea of domain-driven design is that we want our software designed to be driven by our domain. So that means we want to let our software grow out of the domain. So it's like a tree that has its roots deeply into the domain. We don't want to be architecture astronauts somewhere out, up in the space. We want to be very close to our domain. And that means that we want to build our software as a reflection of our domain. So we want to see what are the different subdomains, the different parts of our domain. And we want to build different software modules out of it. We want to see what are the work items our users are working with. We want to put them into the software. We want to see what actions are done with them, which language is used. And all of this stuff we want to have in our software, not only in the user interface, but also in our code, also in our software architecture. So we want to find the language from the domain in the code and all the other things. And the work objects, the items our users are working with, we want to have in the software architecture. What we're doing then is building a model. So when we're programming, when we're building a software for a domain, we're building a domain model. We're modeling the domain. Okay. More concrete, what does this mean? When we look at our domain story, then we can see a central work item we have is the contract, the leasing contract. And that means when we're object-oriented, we want to have a class leasing contract or contract. And what's even more interesting is what is done with these work objects. What's done with the leasing contract? It's signed and it's voted, and we make methods out of this. So what we get there is a domain model with rich domain behavior, which has a lot of words from the domain, from the domain language, aus der Fachsprache in it. So we have leasing contract and sign and vote, all words that come from our domain. And we don't have class and object, and we don't have get and set, and we don't have create, read, update, delete. Those are words from our language, from our technical language. These are words from the domain, from the leasing domain. Okay, then we get a domain model like this. That's great, rich domain behavior, everything fine. The typical idea of object orientation. We take the objects from the world and put them into the computer. Basic idea. So what's happening when we let this domain model grow? When we look deeper into our leasing domain? Then you can see everywhere, everything we're doing in leasing is, of course, happening in the leasing contract. So the contract class will grow and grow and grow and grow. So we don't just want to sign and vote our contract. We want to extend it. We want to terminate it. Maybe we want to sell it to a refinancer, and all this stuff. And there will be lots of methods, lots of code in our leasing contract class. And it will get big.
bigger and bigger. And that may be a problem. Because we now have one big model, and the truth is maybe that's more something like an illusion. So the one big model, the good thing about the one big model is we have everything settled in one place, and all the problems we have with the leasing contract, we know we have to go to this class, and it's settled once and for all. So that's what we hope when we build one big model. But beware, there's a sad truth. Um, the reality is something else. The reality is that we don't have just one big model, but we have several mixed models. Because on a big model, there are different people working on it, and nobody's there who understands the whole model. Everybody has only parts of it and has a mental model of this code. So nobody knows exactly what's happening. So at this point, I would like to cite the late Karl Lagerfeld um, and what he had to say about models. He just said, whoever uses a canonical model has lost control over his life. Or in German, wer ein unternehmensweites Modell einsetzt, hat die Kontrolle über sein Leben verloren. Well, to be honest, he probably said something about sweatpants or jogging hosen, but it's still true. A canonical model, ein unternehmensweites Modell, ein großes Modell, a big model, is problematic. Why? Why is that? That's for different reasons. One thing is a big model is so big that it's too complex to be understand as a whole. So we have this complexity, we have this domain, and we want to bring this complexity into our head, into our brain. We want to wrap our head around it. And as we can see, the domain is bigger than our brain. So that means the model is too big to be understood as a whole. And a model that's too big to be understood as a whole has several problems. One problem is that it leads to whack-a-mole issues in the program. What's whack-a-mole issues? You know this game, whack-a-mole? So there's a board with holes in it, and then the mole comes out, and you have to put with a hammer, you, you have to put your hammer on the mole. And then the mole comes out of another hole, and it goes like this. And the same is true for every software system that exceeds a certain size. When you do a change to such a big system, you um, turn, <coughs> you turn here, and then you have a problem there. And then you turn there, and you have a problem there. And then, ah, lucky. No more problems. But it's only luck. Because it's so big, <laughs> we, we, we just don't know. <laughs> Typically, we just don't know, and uh, we, we just don't see it. And there is a problem we only know in, in production later. And we have to rely on luck. Some, um, <clears throat> somehow, we have to be lucky that it, there are no more problems. Because we don't understand this pr um, model or the software as a whole. So big models lead to whack a mole issues. That's one thing. So we cannot be sure that the changes we make don't lead to problems or to errors in the, in the software. Another problem is these uh, Max and Morris kind of problems. This is the, the first prank or the first trick. Um, I don't know if you know this outside of Germany, um, Max and Morris. Um, they're, what they're doing is they're taking breadcrumbs and tying them together with a rope, and then they throw the breadcrumbs um, to the chickens of Witwe Bolte, Widow Bolte. And the chickens um, eat the, the breadcrumbs, and now they're tied together. And then they try to walk, and it's, it's not working. And then they strung themselves on the, string themselves on the, on the apple tree. So, jedes legt noch schnell ein Ei, und dann kommt der Tod herbei. Esle. It's the punchline in German. I, I, I cannot translate that to English, sorry. Um, so this is what's happening when 
different teams are working on a software that has one big model. Because all the teams are working on the same code, on the same model, and they're tied together and nobody can move um, in the direction he wants to go. And what's finally happen happening is this. It's another kind of strangler pattern we can see there. So working with different teams on a big model is problematic. And I was talking about models the whole time. Maybe we have to look at this idea what a model is more closely. So what's a model? For me, in this sense, a model is a tool to understand the world. Okay, what's that? Let's look at this more philosophically. So this is the world, and we want to understand the world, so we want to put it into our brain. So something like this. World, arrow, brain. Problem, of course, the world is much bigger than our brain. And fun fact, in real life, uh, the difference is much bigger <laughs> than on this slide. Okay, so the world is bigger than our brain. The interesting thing is, we still can understand the world. We still can wrap our hand around the world. And why is that? That's possible because we're able of abstraction. We can only look at the essential and leave the inessential out. And then we only have to understand the essential. And the essential is much less than the whole world with all its details. Another word is model building. That's what we're doing. When we're abstracting, we're building a model. The model only contains the essential stuff, the inessential is left out. So we use the model as a tool to understand the world. And that means good models, models are small, or are not smaller that, than that we can understand them as a whole. That means every model has a natural maximum size. Okay. Very good, but still the question stays, what is the essential? So it's easy to say, oh, we just want to abstract, we take the essential out of the world, leave the inessential out, but what is the essential? And as I said for starters, I'm a consultant, so you know my answer to every question. That is, it depends, of course, it has come drauf an. And it depends on what? It depends on the context. It depends on the context what is essential and what's not essential. In different contexts, different things are essential or are inessential. And that means, for different contexts, we want to have different models. Because we want to have small models, and we want to use different essential things. And that's what we're doing with the world. We build different models for the world. For example, this globe. The globe is used in a context where we want to show that the world is turning. Other models for the world are maps. And in these maps, like this one, we don't show that the world is turning. It's not essential in that context. We're not interested in that detail of the world. We're interested in other things. We want to see where the continents are and what their names are. Interesting is especially this thing here. Atlas, we call it in German. I don't know if it's called Atlas in, in English. So it's a book which is a collection of maps. And every site, every page in this book is a model for the world. So we have 10 pages for Africa, and every page of this um, is a model for itself. So we have one thing where we can see Africa politically, where we can see the borders, and the capitals and the countries. And we have one page for um, Africa physically where we can see the rivers and the mountains and all this stuff, and other pages. And we could put all these things into one page, into one model, but then it would be much too much detail and we couldn't understand what's happening there. So that's why we use different models for the same thing, for the same thing in the world. 
And what DDD tells us is that we want to do the same with our domain when we build software. We don't just want to build one model, but we want to build several models. Because the one big domain model has all these issues we've seen. Okay, how do we find the areas where we, or how do we find our different models? Where do we split our big model into different models? When we look back to our domain story, together with our domain experts, then we want to identify the subdomains, so different parts of the domain that are connected to each other but are um, separated in a way. So when we look into this story, maybe we can see here is an area. It's called sales. Again, a word from our domain. That's the sales subdomain. The customer and the salesperson, they are working in the sales subdomain. And then we have an area down here where the risk manager is working. That's the risk management. And we're doing different things in these areas. We have the same work items. We have the contract again and again, but we're doing different things with the contract. And in this case, also different actors are working there. That's not a must. Okay, those are the subdomains. Um, we can find them in the domain. They are there if we build software or not. But when we build software, you want to take these subdomains and let them drive us, that's why it's called domain-driven, to find our software modules. So, okay, sorry. So these are our subdomains, and what, you, what we want to find is parts where we can support with software. So in the sales subdomain, we can see this is maybe something where we can build software for, or where we want to build software. The calculation of the installment for the contract and the signing of the contract. This stuff here, telling the wish to the customer, uh, of the customer to the salesperson and giving the card to the customer. This will still happen outside of the software. So we build a software module that comes from the subdomain and typically this is smaller than the subdomain because we still have humans and they still have interaction with each other. And down here, the risk management, that we can see how we can support almost everything with software. So the red things, those are the subdomains. That's something that comes from the domain. That's something that's already there. That's part of the problem. And the blue frames, that's what we build. That's where we come in, where we build software that's solution. So we build two modules here, one sales module and one risk management module. Two domain models, one sales model, one risk management model. So we split up the monolithic big domain model and build several models out of it. So we don't want to have this one big class contract with sign and vote in it but we want to have at least two classes. Two classes with the same name, leasing contract, with different methods, because we're doing different things with them. So one class, leasing contract, where we sign, one class, leasing contract, where we vote. So we take the same thing from reality and build not only one model, but build different models. Same contract in the real world, different models in the software. Because real world domain is complicated, our domain models we want to have simple. Because then we can work with them. So when we put the borders around them, then we can see this, the, the frames from our domain story, the sales and the risk management thing. And in DDD, we call them bounded context. Bounded because we have a boundary around them, and context because that's the context where a domain model is living in. Who has heard the word bounded context? Most of you. Okay, great. 
So this is what we get. A sales bounded context, a risk management bounded context. Two models of the same thing. And we do this with the whole domain, and then we cut the whole domain into pieces, the whole cow into several pieces. And there are different possibilities to implement bounded contexts. So when we're on the JVM, we can use the packages mechanism, or we can use the jigsaw modules if we have Java 9 on your. They can help us to separate our models. When we're in .NET, we can use DLLs and this stuff. But of course, this conference is called microexchange. So um, another possibility is to put them into different microservices or self-contained systems or verticals. Um, I don't want to fight if that's the same or if there are subtle differences between these um, words. But all of them are interesting when we think about these model things, because when we look at the word microservices, we can see we want to have them micro, we want to have them small. The models should be small to be understandable. When we see self-contained systems, then we can see that our bounded context should not only be divided on the domain layer, but also the the database and the UI, probably. And when you th think about verticals, then we can see the first thing we want to use when we cut our architecture is a vertical cut. So we want to look at our bounded context first, like this. And then we look into the, in, into the architecture of the particular bounded context. And maybe we cut that horizontally. OK. Um, how do we find these different bounded contexts in the domain story? So here we can see a couple of indicators. There are only indicators because there are no recipes or, or stuff. So um, it's a gut feeling in the end. So one indicator is one-way information flow. That's something that we can see here. The sales person passes on the contract to the risk manager, there we can see we have a one-way information flow. That can be an indicator that there's a boundary between two contexts. More interesting is the second thing is different use of the same thing. So we have a contract here, and we have a contract over there, and we're doing different things with it. Here we calculate an installment, and we sign it. Here, we vote it. And those are different kinds of animals we're doing with this thing. It's also an indicator that we have a context boundary. Difference in language. That's a hard one. We always want to hear and listen to our users what kind of language they are using. And maybe they have subtle differences. Maybe they call the thing, same thing with different names. That may be sign for a boundary, maybe they use the same word and mean something subtly different. And fourth, different triggers. Um, what we can see here on the left in the sales is this process or this part of the process is triggered whenever the customer comes and tells a wish for the car. And this pro process here is only triggered when the salesperson passes on a contract. That can be asynchronously, and that's, that happens only if the customer has um, signed the contract. So this part maybe happens a lot often. So we calculate a lot of different contracts, but they never pass on to the risk management. Another indicator. And of course, in the end, the most important thing is ask your domain experts. We want to discuss with our domain experts where are the subdomains. We want to find it out together with them. And typically not with just one expert from a domain, but with experts from different um, departments, from different areas of, of our domain. OK. So this is what we're doing. We're drawing our domain in one story, typically in several stories, and then we try to 
draw frames, to find the subdomains, to find the bounded contexts. And these bounded contexts then are candidates to become our microservices later. OK, this is easier when you're in the green field, of course, but most of us aren't, I assume. What's the right thing to do in the brown field when we already have a monolith, when we already have the big ball of mud? So what I think, um, or what's working for me when I'm working with clients is something like this. So we put the monolith aside for a moment and start with the knowledge we have today. So we draw a couple of domain stories to find out what's happening in the domain. And then we draw a context map. So that's a map where we put all the bounded context and we found from the domain stories, like we would do when we were starting on a green field. So we know this is what, how we would build the system if we started today. And then, of course, we take our system and analyze that and see where's the architecture, what kind of architecture do we have in the old system. And then we want to move this architecture more closely to the to the right, um, um, where we have our bound concepts, like context like we would have them today. So and then, um, it's typically a good idea to start with a so-called supporting domain. Not start with the most important part of your system and cut it out of the monolith, but tape one of the less important parts. So you can learn how to extract that part for your particular situation. But after that, when you have done that successfully, when you know how to do it, then you will go at the core or one of the cores of the core domains because there is where you get most of the use out when you get the core domain out of your system. OK, um, looking at the time, I can tell you a bit more about um, details of domain storytellers. Uh, domain storytelling, there are different modes, how you can use it. There's the co-op mode. That's, uh, of course, more fun when you're standing together around um, a whiteboard or a pinboard or something like that, and you can draw on it together. So you can picture see here how that. The other mode is moderated. That's a group of people is sitting together, and one guy is in the front and painting it, like um, we had it here, like Stefan here. So he's listening to the users and let them, lets them tell their story and paints it. And when we look at the tools, there are different tools we can use. I've shown you PowerPoint here. That's not so well suited for workshops, of course. But for documentation, maybe you want to use it. Like here, um, I like to use a whiteboard in combination with sticky notes, because then you can move around the sticky notes and you can refactor easily what we're doing here. Sorry. Um, how, about you, how about UML? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I think typically you start with something like this, and then you can go to something like UML. Because UML is, for most diagram types of, for, of UML, are made for communication between developers, from developer to developer. This is a means of communication between domain expert and developer. So use case diagrams, so use case diagrams is something that um, you can start with, and then for every use case, you, you draw a dom um, domain story, something like that. And then, as we have seen earlier, you can extract a, a class diagram out of this. So another thing, when we're, when we're working with these whiteboards, um, and you don't have stickies, or you, you don't like the stickies, then you can use this whiteboard kit. That's interesting. Those are paintable magnets, and that you also can move them around. OK. More pictures. Um, when you have something like this, that's also great. These um, big smart boards, they're a lot of fun, because you can draw everything on it, and you can save them easily afterwards. Problem is, they're pretty expensive, especially this, this Microsoft Surface. And that's the best thing I've used, pretty expensive. OK, when you're more into something electronic and you want to use a tool, then you can find something here. It's called the Domain Story Modeler. 
Um, maybe I can show it. Maybe. Okay. And I need a um, prompt for that. No. Um, it's open source on GitHub, but we as a company host uh, something like this, and there we can use it. So, very simple tool. We have the customer, and he tells his wish for a car to the salesperson, and so on. And the salesperson is doing something with the contract. Very easy JavaScript um, based on, on BPM NIO. So Bernd has left the room. Uh, okay, it's based on, on um, BPM NIO, and the idea is that you can run it in any browser and then upload and download the stuff. Um, it's a nice tool, but as all tools, um, it will. You cannot be as creative than as you can be on a whiteboard. Don't have the icons you want to draw yourself and all this stuff. Okay. Sorry. Oh no, sorry, that's the wrong slide deck. That's one that's happening when you put two slide decks together just before you start your talk. Yeah, there you can find it when you want to run it on your own computer. Okay. Yeah, if we had the time, um, then we would do it now, but we don't have it. So um, I stick to the further reading. If you want to look more closely into this stuff, um, if you're interested in a real-world example and this leasing stuff, how it's implemented in... Java, then you might want to look into the Leasing Ninja. Um, you will find nothing under this domain now, but um, I will push it to GitHub soon. <laughs> so um, leasingninja.io is... I, I, I already own the domain. And, okay. and I will uh, push it before Christmas. I don't know which year. Okay. So that's for real-world examples. If you want to look into the slides again, you can find them in my speaker deck. If you're interested in reading about domain storytelling, this is the official website and the official hashtag. And um, Stefan tweeted one year ago that he and I are writing a book about it. You can find it on LeanPub. There are already, I don't know, 10 or 20 pages. Um, Google for LeanPub domain storytelling. And of course, for this book, it's interesting for us um, that other people are using the same method. And so if you're using domain storytelling, tell us your story. We're interested in how it's working for you. And yeah, I'm near the end with that. If you want to have swag, there are great domain storytelling stickers. I have them here in my bag. And thank you. That's it. And I, and I think we have time for one or two questions. If they are. The mic is coming. Hey. Um, I, I think the biggest problem is that most of the time you don't have the one person that can tell the story. So what do you do about that problem then? Yeah. When you have that problem, um, you have a real problem, then any method <laughs> uh, will not help you. <laughs> so... Um, if you don't have access to real domain knowledge, then you're doomed to build a failing software, if you ask me. So, um, what are you doing about this? Um, that's more, maybe more a, a topic of um, politics and soft skills. You have to find out who the right persons are and how to get them into your, um, uh, how to get into your 
meetings and how to get their time. Um, one thing that helps when using methods like domain storytelling or other things is that when you have the people for the first time with you and they see what you're doing, they see, okay, there's somebody who's actually interesting in what I'm doing. And um, what you can tell people is the truth that you want to support them with their work, and they see, ah, okay, this is, this is a different kind of software development. Now people are interested in what I'm doing, now people are interested in helping me, me out. So typically when you start with it, um, you, you get in, into a better flow. Okay. Can we get the microphone now? Hi. Hi. Um, did you ever uh, apply it uh, to domain storytelling with your uh, customers, um, also with event storming? Yeah, thank you. I was hoping for this question. Um, what about event storming? So, um, what is event storming? Event storming is another great tool of um, communicating directly with your domain experts. The idea is that you have um, thousands of sticky notes and put them onto a wall. And um, I love the tool very much and I use it a lot. And the question is, of course, is it like this? So this was the meme of the year 2018. Um, and the truth is, no, it's more like this. Um, we have two great tools and can't decide which one to use. And um, what I... What, what happens to me um, all the time is that I start with one tool and it works great and then I go on with that tool and it doesn't work out anymore. And then it's good to have one then more tool in your box. So um, it's not clear, not clear yet when to use which tools and those are not the only ones. There are other things like user story mapping um, and so on that's also interesting. Um, but it's important that you can get a different grip on the same um, domain. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, a couple of colleagues and I are planning a so-called collaborative modeling camp um, where we want to look at all these different tools and, and bring them together. So Google collective modeling camp. I, I don't think that you will find something now yet. But better follow me on Twitter and then I, I will write about it. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much, Henning, and uh, see you all back after the break. Okay. Thank you.